Hi, I'm Steve Sarkissian, uh, clinical professor of ophthalmology at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, I'm joined here with uh, my, my colleague and friend, Ike Ahmed. And uh, welcome to uh, Glaucoma Today Journal Club. And uh, so, uh, Ike, we had a, a, gr a great opportunity to talk this morning about the, not only minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, but also conventional glaucoma surgery, and in particular, um, the, cl the combining of the, the data of the two large uh, trials comparing the Ahmed versus the Barvelt glaucoma implants. Could you have, please tell us a little bit about what, what the, 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 this data showed and, and how it changes things for us? Sure, Steve. Uh, as always, you look great with your outfit, man. Always look forward to what you're wearing at these meetings. I gotta um, just catch up with your do. You bring it <laughs> with your do. You bring in so much credibility. I gotta do other things. So it's a, you good, know. It's a good pairing, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, never before we had this have this much data on traditional surgery uh, between the TVT, the PTVT, the primary two versus TRAB, the AVB study, and the ABC study, uh, and you know these studies running over ten years in, in organization. We have a tremendous amount of data that now we can look at to guide us as far as when these devices should be used and how they compare to each other. Uh, and, this, and what we talked about here was comparing uh, both the Ahmed and Barevelt now with both studies, comparing the di difference between performance and, and risk. You know, both AVB and ABP, ABC studies comparing prospectively the difference between Ahmed and Barevelt were very similarly designed. Uh, you know, over eight to nine years ago when we designed these, there were five-year studies comparatively speaking. Both Don Budenz and I spoke about pulling the data together and having a very powerful cohort of over 500 patients, you know, the largest surgical study that, that, you know, that, we, that, that will be published, uh, comparing the performance of these devices now pooled. And uh, remarkably, again, these studies were so similar, we were able to actually achieve a lot of similarities in terms of comparisons. So we're excited about that. We're also excited about the fact that we have the primary two versus TRAB one-year data, and it's really great to be a glaucoma surgeon having this data to guide us for therapy. Fantastic. Yeah, I was, I was in the ABC trial, and you were, of course, uh, l largely uh, Responsible for the, uh, the the other the other cohort and and uh, do you think you know I, I was I was not necessarily surprised by the results and uh, but uh, w tell me were you were you surprised or was there was there anything in particular that that you took from that 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 perhaps or insights that perhaps we didn't quite fully understand before? Well, I think a couple of things. I mean, prior to these uh, you know randomized prospective trials, we did have retrospective data which did seem to indicate some trends at least, you know, some trends in terms of favorability for Iopilo and for, for the Barevelt, and perhaps uh, a safer profile for the Ahmed. And both these studies did seem to indicate that on their own. Uh, both in their own ways showed higher success rate uh, with the Barevelt device, showed lower IOPs and lower medication use, but did show that there were more hypotony-related complications, more interventions in the Barevelt group. Now, by pooling the data together, of course, we have just a much more powerful cohort uh, that we can compare, you know, uh, these uh, differences in a larger setting. So really, uh, these, you know, kind of reaffirmed for me at least what the differences were. Um, I think they showed again that, the, you know, the bare can, can achieve a couple of millimeters of more IOP lowering and, and more medication uh, reduction compared to the Ahmed, but the Ahmed does seem to have less interventions required and less hypotenuse-related complications that sometimes need to be, you know, reoperated for. So it gives us some guidance as far as patient selection. Uh, it's interesting, you know, people take this and say, well, you know, the Ahmed may be something that I feel is, is reasonable enough to, to lower pressure uh, and maybe a good starting point. Others will look at this and say, I need to get uh, low uh, from the beginning, so I'm going to choose something that, uh, you know, that has more efficacy. So, so this is where, uh, you know, the art of medicine is always going to come into play, even with this evidence-based uh, work that we're doing. Yeah, I was, I was surprised, uh, Steve Getty, in talking about the primary TVT trial, basically said if your pressure is somewhat in the, in the uh, below 21, then actually the rate of failure was pretty high for two primary tubes in that, that group. And, you know, and I, I think that's kind of our, our sense of things anyway with tubes is, here's my, so here's, this is interesting. I think that this is powerful, these are powerful data, but in the, in the, the way things are going, I mean, I, I went from doing 10 express shunts a week and five Ahmed valves a week to doing one of each a month almost, really, and, and you're probably hardly ever doing them because you're, you know, you have had access to the Zen and the InFocus for so long. I mean, do, do you see that uh, in, in some ways this, these data are going to become significantly le less relevant in the next two, three years? It's a great question. I think, uh, I don't think, they, I don't think they know the answer to that yet, of course, but I do see, you know, our, we see our trap numbers, you know, going down over the last 20 years and continue to go down. You know, tubes have been on the upswing, uh, but still overall relatively low numbers. I, would, I do envision that I think these uh, less invasive and minimally invasive options are going to be more and more used and, and more and more 
applied even earlier in the treatment paradigm. Uh, there probably always be a role for tubes, I think, just in terms of the robustness for certain high risk populations. Um, but I think that the trends are certainly there. But this data really does tell us again, you know, how these how these devices compare. Uh, you know, what the role for current, for example, bleb form procedure without a plate, if you want to call it that in a generic sense, may may fit particularly in patients who start off with a low pressure or lower pressure. Uh, you know, plates, you know, in a primary setting don't seem to lower pressure as well when the pre-op pressures are lower than 21, for example, as 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 was shown in the uh, primary two versus versus trap study. But the, you know, the complications are maybe slightly higher in the TRAB group. The reoperations for complications are higher in the TRAB group. This is where some of these newer microstenting approaches, ab internal or ab external, will per may perhaps show some differences with TRABs. Again, we have trials that are underway for that. So you're right. I mean, ev evidence often lags behind current practice because of the time it's t taken to design studies and follow up patients and then report on them. Um, but I think this is, these are still pretty highly relevant for now, for, for today's world. But in a few years, I think, yeah, things are going to change. And I'm looking forward to, again, we have other studies that are going on, as you know, that are going to provide us evidence for how these newer devices compare to now some of these older, or if you want to call them older procedures. Yeah, no, thanks. That's fantastic information. And uh, I'm glad to, glad to be here with you. And uh, here with, uh, with Ike Ahmed, my brother in arms, against the, uh, uh, the enemy of blindness. And uh, we, uh, we thank you for being with us here at uh, Glaucoma Today Journal Club.